Wonderful. Okay, we're going to be in, uh, back in Isaiah chapter 9, actually. So uh, we are continuing on in our Advent series, and our focus, as you know already, uh, is on peace. And so we're celebrating Christmas, taking a four weeks prior to Christmas to focus on Christmas on the incarnation. Christmas is about celebrating this beautiful fact that the Lord came to be with us. He came, descended, came down and entered into our humble world, our fallen, broken world. And he comes bearing gifts. When Jesus came into the world, he comes bearing gifts, not toys or scarves or the latest gadget, but wonderful gifts, great gifts, gifts that are unlike any other gift, a gift of hope, a gift of peace, a gift of joy, a gift of love. These are the gifts that we celebrate. These are the gifts that break into our lives like light breaking into darkness. They rescue us. These are the gifts that he gives that rescue us from being caught up in the corruption of the fallen world that we live in. These are the gifts that enable us to live in this fallen world, and it keeps us from being destroyed by what would have happened to us except for the grace of God. These are wonderful gifts. That's why I want to draw attention to each of them each week. Keeping with a little bit of the illustration from last week, these gifts are like the engines on an airplane. These are the mechanisms from God, the grace of God that function in our lives, that, that give us lift, that accelerate us, that keep us up, keep us moving, keep us moving forward, keep us uh, in the ability to live in God's grace and for his glory. So last week we talked about hope. This week we want to talk about peace. As soon as I say the word peace, I don't doubt all of you already had the wheels turning, and that word peace means something to you presently, currently, in your life right now. Well, some of you are tracking very closely with the war in Ukraine, and your heart is there. You follow the news, and you're interested. You may have some relationship, some connection there, and so when you hear the word peace, you might be immediately thinking about war versus peace, realize, realizing how terrible war is and how destructive war is and your desire is for peace. You might be raising young children. And peace to you means that moment late in the evening when you got them all tucked in. You already made three water glass trips. You've had two conversations that there's really no boogeyman underneath the bed. And you finally are at the moment in that day when you think, I think they're all down. I think they're all asleep. And you sit on the couch and you say, finally, peace and quiet. And before you finish the sentence, you're nodding off and snoring there on the couch. Maybe that's your idea of peace. It's very possible that some of you are currently, presently, in some kind of relational conflict or struggle and so for you when I say the word peace immediately this comes to mind some need some hope that this would be made right maybe a spouse that you're currently not getting along well with or a family member the holidays tends to bring this up because families come together and sometimes when you put families together conflict and strife is right there with them and the differences kind of come out as you're spending time together might be a friend might be another church member whenever there's a relational conflict some kind of breakdown we immediately feel the sense of a lack of peace we feel our need for it when I say peace for you it might be that immediately what comes to mind is what's going on in your inner person within your own soul you are experiencing a genuine lack of peace just inside yourself anxiety fear worry anger depression 
you are acutely aware of a lack of peace within your own soul. And so when you hear that word, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, there's any way to lift this darkness. There's any way to quell this turmoil that's in my own soul right now. That's what peace immediately means to you. Not far from that could be the experience of guilt and shame. We carry these things and it's difficult. Something you did, something you didn't do, something from your past, something about who you are that is causing you presently to get caught up in shame and guilt and you live under a kind of cloud, a pail over your life and it's hard to shake. It's there and you talk about forgiveness but it still kind of holds on to your soul and you feel it. And so when I say peace, first thing that comes to mind is, oh, that I could be free from not feeling ashamed, from not feeling guilty about who I am or what I've done. The point that I'm trying to make is that the subject of peace is all around us all the time in all aspects of life. You can't escape it. You, you face it no matter which way you turn and it infiltrates all aspects of life. Our physical lives, our emotional lives, our spiritual lives, our psychological lives. There's always some kind of threat to peace and when there is some kind of disruption of peace in any area of our lives, the, the realization is that particular thing is predominant in our lives. It's like it's the only thing going on in the universe. When I am not at peace, physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, it's like nothing else really matters. Nothing else really exists. That is where I need God's grace. The good news with that is that when the Bible talks about peace, it embraces it all. So we're not talking about having a multiplicity of need for peace, and God says, I give you peace, and the peace that he gives is only designated for one of those categories. He gives us this gift of peace, and while it has a starting point, it has an outworking, and it spreads and works and infiltrates every area of our lives where we need peace. The biblical word for peace you're probably familiar with is the word shalom. I'd like to read you a little definition. Uh, my Friday morning book group, we're going through Cornelius Planting, a junior's book. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It starts off with a chapter on shalom. And uh, basically, here's the definition that Plantinga gives. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets called shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind of a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. A rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way it ought to be. It's the way it ought to be. The way it was created to be prior to sin. The expectation when there is no sin, that's the description. Life filled with joy, life with God, in communion with God, walking out our greatest potential of knowing and enjoying God. My aim this afternoon, my hope, my prayer, is very simple, to stir up faith in your hearts for the Prince of Peace. Direct your attention, direct your hearts, inspire your faith to place trust in this Prince of Peace. I'd like to just pick up where we left off uh, last week and stay with the same text from Isaiah chapter 9. I'll read again verses 1 through 7. We 
actually heard one in the Advent reading as well. And I want to make just a simple journey, a little bit different format this afternoon. I want to move from Isaiah's promise of this Prince of Peace to Jesus and from Jesus into our lives. Let's just draw a simple line. Isaiah's promised king to Jesus, from Jesus right to us, right to our hearts. Let me read the passage again. Isaiah chapter 9, 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time. He brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You've multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you've broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the lord of hosts will do this from the promise to the prince isaiah promised a king to an audience that was steeped in deep darkness. A people who had forsaken God, the God who had rescued them, now threatened by war, and now under the reign of a king who is proving himself to be both ungodly and unwise. Everything in their lives is an absence of peace. On all fronts, everywhere they looked, everything that they were experiencing, everything said not peace. They were in what our prophet is telling us was deep darkness. The hope comes as the prophet tells us about a promised king and gives us these four wonderful names. And we spent time on three of them last week and we'll focus on the fourth today. Wonderful counselor, God-given wisdom. Mighty God, God given strength and power, everlasting Father, a steadfast love for his people, and today, a prince of peace. We defined just a minute ago what peace is all about. We use planting as definition there to understand what the Bible talks about when it uses the word peace, but what does it mean to be a prince of peace? Why would he get the title prince of peace? Well, a prince is a royal term explaining to us that this promised king has authority and ability to deal out peace. These people that were hearing this message first from Isaiah, these were people living under the reign of King Ahaz. Any peace or lack thereof rested entirely with their king. They were dependent upon Ahaz making wise decisions, good interactions with the neighboring nations, making good sound judgments for the good and well-being of the people. But he did not. He proved to be ungodly. He proved to be foolish and actually led the people into a greater lack of peace. These folks were vulnerable. They were vulnerable because of their king. The king was deciding the level of peace that they would live in or experience. And so as they are under the heavy, deep darkness and burden of a foolish and unwise and ungodly king, experiencing all kinds of a lack of peace, 
Isaiah promises a different kind of king who will be called the prince of peace. In other words, I'm sending you a king. A king is coming. A king will present himself who is able and powerful to bring about peace in your life. The title also describes not just his ability, but his character and his purpose. This is why he's taking the throne. This is not, it's who he is. It's his character. He is a prince of peace. He sits on the throne. He reigns with the sole purpose, I am going to bring about peace in the hearts and lives of the people under my care, under my reign. He is the prince of peace. He's not just able to handle a little peace now and again. But his main idea is to amass more land or to expand the nation. No, he's the prince of peace. It's like why he's there. That's what he's all about. I reign for your peace. That's why I've taken on this role. Let's start drawing our line from Isaiah's promised king to Jesus. Familiar text, Luke chapter 2, verse 14. When the angels appeared to the shepherds out in their fields and to announce the birth of this king, after explaining what was taking place, it says, Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and this child, Jesus, is born, and a host of divine beings make this declaration, on earth peace. It's why he came. It's why he was sent. It's why he's taking on this role. It's why he's called the Prince of Peace. This is a divine announcement for the Prince of Peace. Next, Jesus grows and he begins his earthly ministry. And he goes into the synagogue and he's given a scroll from Isaiah. He opens it and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when he sat down, and everyone was looking at him. He said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Luke 4.18. A detailed description of bringing peace. An itemized list of what it means for somebody to come who has authority and ability to bring about peace. That's the announcement. Simple conclusion, no surprise. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but the one who Isaiah prophesied about was Jesus. If you get taken a test in children's ministry, you know the answer. Who was the child in Isaiah chapter 9? Yes, it was Jesus. I just want to direct your hearts to the Savior, to Jesus. He's the promised one. And then let's move from the prince back to the people. Let's identify how does this prince actually bring peace to the people. Isaiah gives us the answer to this. Everybody's understanding was how do you bring about peace? Well, you have a stronger army and you defeat your enemies. And so you bring about peace. All the people that are warring and fighting against you, you fight back harder. You're stronger, you're better, you're wiser, and so you fight harder and so you bring about peace. But this Prince of Peace does something very different. Throughout the book of Isaiah, Isaiah presents the Savior in three different ways. I mentioned this last week. 
over the first half of all of Isaiah's chapters focus on this promised king, this royal one who is going to come and reign. But he moves from there to the suffering servant and then concludes his book with the anointed deliverer. When we're in the section about the suffering servant, we get a clue. We get it explained to us how this Prince of Peace actually brings peace into our lives. Isaiah 53, again, familiar verses. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. How does this Prince of Peace actually execute his mission to bring peace into the hearts and lives of the people? Jesus plunges himself into the deep darkness that we find ourselves in, that the people of Isaiah 9 found themselves in. Jesus steps down into it, plunges himself down into the depths of this deep darkness, the chaos that sin has produced, and willingly allows the destruction of it all to fall upon him. Even though he himself was without sin, He accepts the consequences and the punishment of sin to fall upon himself. Our destruction has run its course with him. The course that you and I were on. Course that would eventually lead to our destruction. We were stuck on that course, trapped on that course, and Jesus condescends and intercepts us in that course and fulfills our course in himself, takes it upon himself. So justice has been met. and That is how his death has brought us peace. So then we know that by his death, we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. First thing, phase one of peace coming into our lives, into our world. Item of first importance. Make people right with God. Okay? Not first on the list, stop all the wars, end world hunger, stop this evil, get rid of bad kings. First order of business. Make people's hearts right with God. Do this first. That is how the problem got started, so that is where the solution begins. What happened with the Israelites in Isaiah chapter 9? Their hearts drifted away from the Lord, and one thing led to another until at some point they are steeped in idolatry, had forgotten and forsaken the Lord, under condemnation, being attacked, about to be exiled out of their land. What about the people of Judah that we've been studying in the book of Ezra? Same thing. Some years prior, decades, centuries prior, hearts drifting away from the Lord. Stop worshiping. Inclined to worship other things. Looking for this, looking for that. Building their lives, ignoring God. That's how it started. And again, they found themselves in the same place under the judgment of God. Outside nations attacking them, about to capture them, take them captive, pull them into Babylon. So 
So where the problem got started is where the problem gets solved in the hearts of the people. First thing, grace of God. How are we going to bring peace from God into the world? We're going to go into the hearts and lives of people and we're going to forgive them and make them right before God. We're going to give them just standing in God's eyes. Declare them righteous. Phase one, starting point. From there, from there, everything. From there, everything is possible. Inward peace is obtainable now. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we've got a starting point for dealing with anxiety and fear and depression. Oh, we have a starting point of, of having peace with God. And because we have peace with God, a peace that surpasses all understanding, that that peace will begin its work, continue its work, and guard our hearts and our minds. From there, peace between us is now obtainable. Ephesians chapter 2. For he himself is our peace, who's made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Okay, so now, phase one done, you have peace with God. We can continue on with the work, and we can from there build peace with one another. Foundation has been laid. Now, getting along with your neighbor, getting along with your family at Christmas, now it's obtainable because the first thing has been taken care of. In Colossians 1, it talks about the peace of God just like going all out, like fixing the universe. Colossians 1 tells us that what he did accomplished far more than forgiving the sins of individual people. It says, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the point that I'm trying to make, that the work of the peace of God, when this gift of peace comes, it has a starting point in individual hearts and lives, but it has an ending point of making all things right. In other words, everything that has disrupted the created order that God has set in order that was good and beautiful and right, that has all been tainted in some way by our rebellion and our sin, that the peace of God comes through Jesus Christ and is going to fix it all. Everything. Things we see, things we can't see, things on the earth, things in the heaven. He's going to reconcile all things. He's going to fix all things. In other words, this Prince of Peace is going to accomplish, has accomplished your forgiveness and your standing with God. But he's not done with his work until there's cosmic peace in the universe and everything is back right the way it was meant to be, the way things are supposed to be. What a prince of peace. What a well-deserved title to call him and him alone the prince of peace. He gives us a unique kind of peace 
Sam and Veronica read this verse as well from John 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Not as the world gives you. I think it's fair to say that Jesus is affirming that there's lots of ways to get peace. That the world contains lots of ways to gain peace peace in this area or that. When my foot is broken, I go to the foot doctor to fix my broken foot. My foot is now at peace. When I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. I can get counsel. I can get help. There's many means of God's grace to come into my life. Because any time I feel an absence of peace, that becomes dominant and that becomes in the forefront of my life. And oh, I need to find peace in this area. I've got to get my foot fixed when my foot is broken. And it seems like nothing else matters at that moment. Jesus says, I'm giving you a peace that's not quite like that. I'm, I'm doing something more than that, not less than that, just much more than that. Because the good doctor can set my foot so that my foot heals well and I'm back to normal, but there's also a list of things where I lack peace where he's not able to help me with that. This Prince of Peace comes and, and approaches us and says, look, I fully understand what's going on here. I fully understand your need. I know all your troubles. It's an amazing thing. Even as I'm listing different areas of peace and you're, you've got your list going and this is where I'm struggling and this is where I'm lacking. It's like he, he, he knows it all. He knows all those details. And yet the child comes on Christmas and he's determined to accomplish first things first. He could have stuck around another 50 years and had healing campaigns and healed all kinds of diseases. He could have fed more and more multitudes. But he did it to show who he was. And then he moves. He says, I've got to make my way. I've got one mission. I've got to get there to the cross. Because if I don't get that accomplished... This peace on earth, this gift of peace is going to be sold short. It's going to come up short. It's not going to accomplish what it needs to. It can't go all the way and fix all things. So he fulfills it. He does it. It's a peace unlike any other peace. My aim is to stir up your faith in the Prince of Peace. Now, I know, I know the challenge of sermons that can sound simplistic. Statements of looking to Jesus, trust the Lord, sound very broad, very impractical. Many times this, the sermon ends, ends to land on ears too simplistic. What can take a lifetime of practice, though, does get started with a few sentences, even sometimes a few sentences in a sermon. Yes, look to Jesus. Yes, trust in the Lord. Come to Christ. But I realize those, those things can make little sense when our hearts are heavy with anxiety or fear, when our lives are feeling torn apart with a Conflict, I, I understand more detail is needed, but I could encourage you to think maybe a little bit differently. Let me give you uh, an example. Let's say you need a friend. If I were to press you and say, who's your friend? You have a close friend, and I've heard this very often. I've been at this church, and I realize I really don't have a close friend. It's difficult. That's a lack of peace that becomes forefront. 
If I stood up and I said, you okay, well, here's how you make a friend. You go to somebody and you spend time with them. I want you to pick somebody. I want you to spend unhurried time. I want you to spend time with them. And while you're with that person, I want you to take a genuine interest in that person's well-being. In other words, I want you to be a good listener. I want you to be able to ask questions. And I want it to be driven by a heart that says, I, I genuinely care what's going on in your life. I want to hear from you. Here to listen. Explain to me what you're going through, what you're dealing with, what you're happy about, what you're sad about. Be a good listener. And the third thing I want you to do is I want you to communicate to that person honestly from your own heart. In time, I want you to just communicate graciously but candidly who you are, what your desires are. Guarantee you'll have a close friend. There it is. Nice and simple, okay? I, I gave it to you in a minute. There you are. There's a secret to making friends in the world, there you have it. Sounds nice and simple, doesn't it? You could write it on your hand. You could write it on a little card. Here's how you make friends. But when I use that example and I say that to you, you also, you realize, you realize that could be a lifetime of effort. Your, your efforts will go up and down. You will wane. You will move forward. You will make attempts that will not get responded to well. You will make poor attempts at trying to do these things. It will get messy along the way. It will get confusing at times. It will be discouraging at times. It will take longer than you think. But you'll also have great delights along the way as well. You'll have successes and you'll have wonderful, meaningful, interactive times that you enjoy. And it will come over time, with trial and error, with failures and successes, and lots of time and effort. So when we get to the end of the sermon and the preacher says, I'll read your Bible every day, pray, trust in the Lord, look to Jesus. I mean, please don't be so quick to just write it off. I, I know sometimes we can give each other pet answers that are shallow and thoughtless. But I talked to you about how to make friends and now if I said, we really need to seek Jesus and follow Jesus and know what it means to abide in Jesus and could you use the same logic and understand that takes place over a lifetime of starts and finishes and false starts and attempts and some successes and some, some failures and we just, we're, we're moving toward it. I said, I said, why don't you take some time each day and listen to Jesus? You could open up a book easily enough and read what he taught and what he said. What if you were a good listener to Jesus? Found out what he values, what he loves, what he likes, what his purposes are. And spent some time listening to him. This beautiful gift called prayer, which means you get to talk to God. And so what if you opened up your heart to him? And use this means of God's grace called prayer and just told the Lord who you are, what you're struggling with, what your joys are, what your successes are, what your failures are, what your desires are, what you're going through. You could take my advice and you could do that tomorrow morning and by noon tomorrow your life will be changed, right? Well... Not everything is made right immediately. But what's our hope? We drew a line from Isaiah's promised king to Jesus and from Jesus to us. And where did the, the line end up? It kind of shot off into the future eternity saying, here's the promise. That king is going to make everything right one day. 
So that's the trajectory that we're on. Now, is everything right today? No. If we got ourselves talking, we'd probably conclude nothing is right today. There's lots of problems. But what do we have? We have a prince of peace whose whole power and ability and purpose is to bring about a peace that you and I can enjoy and know and live in the good of. We know it because we know he died for it. And we know his death was successful in it because God raised him from the dead. So we have a wonderful hope in the peace of God in our lives. Worship team, you can come on up. I, I, but I'd, I'd like us to take some time to pray. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I want to ask you to close your eyes because I want to ask you to respond. And I want you to feel just open and comfortable in responding about the lack of peace in your life. I listed off a few aspects at the beginning of this message on how we encounter a lack of peace. It's very possible that some of you are not sleeping well. It's very possible that some of you are anxious inside and fearful. Some struggling with a anger surging inside your soul. You're just not at rest, not at peace. Some of you are weary and tired. Well, your eyes are closed. Mine are open and so are God's. And could you raise your hand to simply say in some way, today I need peace from God. Depressed, fearful, anxious, sleepless, whatever it might be. Wonderful. So, Father, we've seen all these hands that have been raised. Uh, an active faith in your eyes to say, Lord, I need you. I'm caught in the midst of this fallen world and in my life today, there's an absence of peace. And you've called us to look and call out to the Prince of Peace who has power, ability, and desire to bring that peace into my life. Lord, thank you for knowing the detail behind each hand that went up, the specific need, the specific kind of peace that's needed. And thank you that the peace that you've made for us, making us right with you through the death of your cross, enables that kind of peace to come into our lives. Spirit of God, I pray that this would be a moment of supernatural working of your spirit in each of these lives to strengthen their heart, to strengthen their minds, to bring that peace, peace that's beyond our understanding into the realities of the troubles that these good folks are facing. Do it for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand and close with a song.